This is Runehammer. disappear into a great gloom above. Flickering light emanates from some strange grotto beyond your sight, and at center, no less than twenty feet tall, megalithic, mechanical, laced with brass and bronze and metals beyond the worlds of men, stands a strange, ancient machine. The apprentice, fifty years younger than his wizened master, inches forward into the gloom. What is it? The old wizard removes his folded hat, and his white beard forms a skull's mask in the darkness as his eyes widen with wonder and fear. For here his eyes finally, after all their questing, all their killing, all the danger, all the doom. He looks upon none other than the ancient relic at the center of all things. For this is the RPG mainframe. Greetings, programs. It's Hanker and Furnail back once again with Runehammer here in the center of the machine that we call the RPG mainframe. This is episode 13 of RPG Talks, and that title was just sort of leaving me flat. So now I like to think of myself as this giant dwarven refrigerator of thinky pants down in some deep dungeon cut by the Iridrum craftsmen of ancient times. <laughs> That's me. The RPG mainframe. If I'm sounding a little froggy, my apologies, but I have been, I have been stricken in 2018. I had this massive flu that probably all of you got. It's like the germs are getting evil these days, just as Stephen King predicted. And then it, it parlayed into some kind of insane pollen allergy madness. So it's been a, it's been a wacky month, and I've really sort of fallen behind on a lot of my work. Uh, as Odin puts my soul to the test once again, but I will rise. Oh yes, I will rise. And this rising will take primarily the form of today's podcast, which is all about monster sets. So before we jump on in, um, I just wanted to thank and welcome all the new patrons who are supporting here on the page. They just keep showing up. I, I'm not sure what the formula is that has led to so many new patrons, but it's just fantastic. So welcome everybody to the RPG mainframe. Um, really, I'm bringing the focus tighter and tighter and tighter uh, here on the Patreon page. So it's really going to be RPG mainframe and a burning in New Haven. Those are really going to be what I'm working on this year uh, as far as the podcast. And then as soon as I'm feeling 100%, again, I need to get back uh, on YouTube and so on and so forth. So welcome, everybody. And as always, thank you from the bottom of my mechanical heart for your support for Runehammer. Okay, so what are monster sets really all about? Now, I think you guys probably know exactly what this sort of challenge is like as a dungeon master, is that you're facing a new piece of content, a new piece of gameplay for your players. It's a couple days away, and you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't know, what what are they going to kill? You know, it, there has to be something to whack with your stick, right? 
you got to be hitting something with your sword and blocking something with your shield for for any knight to be fun. Now, maybe you know your overarching story or you know like where the plot's going to go or what your sort of big villain is going to be doing or maybe um, where the players are. But if you're like me, there's always this, not always, but a lot of times, this hole that you're filling in at the last minute or you're filling in under some duress which is exactly what are the monsters going to be sort of this week that are going to be interesting. Now, one approach that I've taken to this is that I actually sort of did this sort of monster manual phone book approach. And what I mean by the phone book approach is uh, it's also known as the monster of the week approach, which is that each session the players can almost count on facing another monster from the monster manual. And over time, they get this fun feeling that they've worked through almost all the monsters in the monster manual. And that makes them, you know, like legit players of D&D. Now that approach worked quite well for me for more than a year, but like all long-term RPG players, you're going to reach a DIY point in your, in your play career. Now, if you guys are newcomers to the hobby, then you might still be playing right out of a monster manual or out of your favorite book or out of a, a Pathfinder bestiary or something like this. And you haven't sort of reached that DIY moment yet. But then if you're a longtime player, I think you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, which is that your players have faced everything that you could read or find in books or online. And you're at the point now where you just need to invent things for them to keep things interesting. And you're inventing you know, umber holders and dwarven battle cubes and, you know, um, clay golems and corroders and, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff that you guys see in my work, which I am a diehard true believer in DIY RPGs. You guys all know that. And so this is really the, the core of RPG mainframe thinking is not only how to execute the hobby, how to go after it, how to know your own mind and your own creativity and put it to use for the hobby, but also the nuts and bolts of the DIY element, which is not just, hey, guys, be smart and access your creative mind. You know, th those are very high level theoretics. For this podcast, I'd like to get much more down on the ground and give you a very specific set of monsters that I designed, which I'll post on a thinky sheet here on Patreon for you to look at. So you can follow along on that thinky sheet image uh, if you're listening to this at your computer. But a very specific set of monsters that is uh, exemplary of a very widely used formula to create enemy sets. And uh, I don't really have a catchy name for it except for that. It's, it's a monster set. And uh, I almost always design my monsters in sets. And so this means you don't just come up with one monster for the week. You come up with three. Three Three for me is like the magic number here with a monster set. So let's just make that a rule right away. A monster set is a trio of monster designs that interplay in a way that's going to make your game night cooler, more fun, more challenging, with more revelation and more escalation and more sort of figure outableness. Now, that is a terrible, terrible term, but I do think it really captures what I look for in a good monster set, is that the players first face the first monster. Okay, that's a monster. Then maybe they face the second one. They're like, oh, oh that's kind of interesting. But then when they face the combination of the first and second, they start to see, oh, that's why that one's that way. Then a little ways down the road, you save your third type. It's first experienced in isolation, but then the full trio is experienced together and the players understand this interlocking and that feeling of understanding is what makes them feel so cool. And it's the revelation. Now, many dungeon masters like to get their players to feel revelation, right? Revelation is one of the most exciting parts of the game. And I think a very common mistake is to believe that players will be thrilled by story or puzzle revelation. Oh, that's why that guy burned the village to the ground. Or, oh, he's actually a villain. Or, oh, this castle is actually where the dimensional portal is. Oh, I see. A lot of DMs will prepare these moments of revelation as if they're going to blow players' minds. But in my experience, it's very seldom that story 
is going to blow a player's mind. I've often found that they're more surprised and delighted by the revelation of their own comprehension of things, their own awesomeness. And a great example of this sensation can be found in the old JRPGs of the 90s, such as uh, Chrono Trigger or uh, Final Fantasy III or some of these old games, where at first you feel completely dominated and outmatched by monster sets. And then as you start to learn the, the nuance of the game, level up some characters, get some items, and learn their interplay and how they can create these combinations, you come back to these unbeatable enemies and you realize, oh man, all I had to do was blah, 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 and I just kick his butt. You're like, oh man, that's cool. That feeling of revelation to me, I see more luminosity in a player's face when they hit one of those moments, then when they realize that the NPC that they've been working with all along is actually the supreme villain or whatever. And so pursuant to that moment of fun at your table, I present to you a little bit of theory and some specifics on the concept I like to call monster sets. So to get started, I'd like to mention some context about where this sort of trio monster set concept has been used in my experience, and I see it everywhere. And the two examples I'd like to talk about are the old Hercules TV show and, as I mentioned previously, uh, JRPGs. And let's just stick to something simple like Final Fantasy III. In both of these cases, the trio of monsters are used in exactly the same way. In the first act, you are introduced to the sort of Mookie monster, the very soft, very killable, very clumsy, very, um, you know, crowd-oriented monster. They tend to die in dozens. They don't really use a lot of strategy. They almost always fight to the death, and they kind of stumble around. And you can, you can put a rope across a road, and a dozen of them will run into the rope and fall down before they figure out to go around, right? They, these are the classic, you know, zombies, goblins, ghouls, kobolds. You know, everybody has these in their game. And almost all the old Hercules episodes and in Final Fantasy, these are what you fight for a great deal of the beginning or the first act, right? You, you meet a bunch of these, you take them out, you kind of feel like, is this all you can conjure, Saruman, right? And, and they're fun, but they're in escalating numbers. And in enough numbers, it can get a little hairy and you might have to pull back or use, you know, a high powered spell to get through it or something like this. But your first thought with the sort of Mookie monster should always be like, is this it? I mean, it's just going to be these kind of little, these little knolls who are running around in these caves. I mean, well, we got this. Yeah, we are awesome. Okay, then you reach your second monster in the trio, which is the one that stands behind. And, and this is a sort of a, an anchor monster. Let's call it the anchor monster. So first you have the Mookies, and now you have the anchor monster. The anchor monster is the one with his arms outstretched who's standing behind a wall of the Mookies and he's casting some effect on them or he's making them more bold or he's making them unkillable or he's making them frenzied. And actually, these Mookie monsters are arriving in an almost infinite wave, but the one who stands behind... Uh, he is no easy thing to defeat. And actually, you won't even defeat the little guys until you go and address this anchor creature. Now, there's a million different examples of this anchor creature in games and movies and so forth. Another example might be in the uh, the King Arthur movie with Clive Owen. Have you ever seen that one? The, the Mookies would be the sort of the Viking, the, the Saxon warriors, right? But then the anchor monster is the, the leader of the Vikings. He doesn't always just run right up and fight. He's kind of back in there. He's coordinating. He's driving them forward. And honestly, you cannot defeat the Saxon horde until you defeat him. This is the anchor monster. And I know that a lot of you guys have used this concept, but to see it as a theoretical construct, not just a coincidence that you were doing this type of combo, this is what gives you the sort of structure to face the creative challenge of monster sets each time. So first you have your Mookies, then you have your anchor monster, and now you have your third sort of <laughs> what you could call the final form. And this is your, your unkillable. This is your big daddy. 
The big daddy is the actual threat. This is the thing that they have been waiting to reveal. This is the the big explosion. This is the flaming catapult. This is the giant mech. This this is what dwarfs the challenges that the players have been facing so far and takes everything to another level. So right when they thought, oh, we figured out the combination of the Mookies and the Anchor. So if you ever encounter, you know, 12 of these little Mookie guys and there's one of these weird wizards standing behind him, don't even bother with the Mookies, just blast the wizard. Okay, they've figured out that puzzle. So then you hit them with a few rounds of that. But then in this weird room or out in this field, they encounter the unkillable, the Big Daddy. And it's this massive machine or it's a big armored golem type character. It's something completely different but with the same markings and color coding that your other two monsters have. So it fits the set, right? That's critical to understand that these three things form a force. They are an organized, uh, you know, unit driven by an agenda or by mind control or by whatever force is driving the evil in your particular scenario, right? But the unkillable is this big daddy and it should just absorb punishment, It can dish out lots of punishment too, but its main function is to be indestructible until some weakness is figured out. Okay, so this is your third monster in your set. So, on the one hand, you have your theoretical construct for monster sets, right? You've got your Mookies, you've got your Anchor, and you've got your Unkillable. Okay, so there's the theoretical sort of angle that I wanted to throw at you. And I'm sure all of you can conjure a zillion examples from TV shows like Hercules uh, or Xena and JRPGs like Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy and how they use this formula to create the gameplay that forces you to reevaluate your strategies, to improve your power levels and your combinations, And also to feel that amazing sensation of satisfaction of understanding the monster set from a player's point of view. So there's your theoretical construct, okay? So now I wanted to give you my specific sort of uh, manifestation of this theory in the form of the Oath Sworn. Now, I've sort of been working on a larger project, which I think I'll announce in time. But for now, I just wanted to show you a sliver of it, which is this sort of large dungeon called Black Salt Spire. And uh, if you look on the Patreon page, you'll see my thinky sheet there with a, a drawing that I did of Black Salt Spire. And I've been working my way into some of the concepts that are going to build this dungeon out. And among them are this monster set. Now, the Oath Sworn, as some of you know, is uh, also a Facebook group of my most trusted ICRPG players uh, who've also helped me refine the game over the past year. And I wanted to get that name, the Oath Sworn, into an actual piece of game content, into an adventure. And so what I did was conjure up this dungeon, Black Salt Spire. Now, this spire rises out of the ocean every hundred years and drinks life dry from the ocean and gives these giants this prolonged life and so on and so forth. But that is my big story. What I wanted was my monster set, and so I came up with the Oath Sworn. So the three monsters that comprise this set are the Oath Sworn, this is the first one, then there is the Oath Reader, and then there is the Oath Machine. Okay, so the Oath Sworn are my Mookies, and uh, these are just helmeted soldiers, and they, they, I think they're undead under there, so you see some skeletal teeth under this helmet. Um, and these are very simple. They have low hit points, they swing a sword at you, they grab onto you, and they charge, you know, ramming into their enemies, and they just sort of fight brutally and clumsily, and they fight to the death, and they, they're blown apart, and their armor flies to bits, and their swords break They are the waves that crash against the rocks of the players. They're what makes players feel powerful. They can defeat 20 of these things in a fight without really even using any of their high-powered resources. So that's the Oath Sworn. These are this, this army of weirdly helmeted undead warriors. And they are enslaved or magically enthralled to the giants of Black Salt Spire. Now, to take the encounters to the next level, I need my anchor monster, right? And my anchor monster is the Oath Reader. Now, the Oath Reader also has these skeletal teeth showing under this weird conical helmet. But the Oath Reader is holding up this scroll. And the scroll is etched with strange runes and concentric circles from times long forgot. And through these sort of skeletal, lipless teeth, 
He's reading these runes aloud in this echoing, booming voice. Now, he has very high hit points. He's very hard to kill. He can only be harmed by magic. And he is saying this oath. And this is the oath. It's in some weird language, but, you know, a player could decode it. But it's basically, we are those who die for the giants of Black Salt Spire. And when he says this, he can point his hand at one of the oath sworn and make them immune to all damage. So he can choose one of the Mookies, make them completely immune, an unkillable warrior. And this is like a huge clue and a way to say, hey, players, you need to deal with the Oath Reader before you can defeat this gang of Mookies, right? Now, his other abilities are Translocate, so he can choose any of the Oath Sworn and swap places with them with a teleport. So he uses the uh, military movements of the Oath Sworn as his movement spell. So wherever they go, he can translocate with them. And the players need to learn this so that they control where the Oath Reader can go. Because if you can't catch up with the Oath Reader, you can't kill him and you can't defeat that immune Oath Sworn. Now, he also has a big, cool, broad axe, like just a good old-fashioned axe. So once you're in his face, he has a reliable melee attack. And also, he has healing touch or, you know, any basic healing spell that he uses mainly on himself. Um, So it will use up one of his actions. And if you want to make this guy really formidable, you give him two actions. If you want to make him a little more low-level, give him one action. Regardless, he serves the function of the anchor monster. This is the Oath Reader. So at first you face groups of Oath Sworn, right? They basically fight like armored skeletons. Okay, yeah, we're slamming through these guys. This isn't so bad. Then you come into a more ritualistic chamber or a more adorned chamber or a chamber behind a locked door, something that feels escalated. And when that escalation occurs, the Oath Reader turns around and lifts on high this weird old scroll and begins, right? And one of the Oath Sworn like gets a little bigger and begins to glow and he's unkillable and whoa, this whole thing has escalated. Then the Oath Reader begins using where the Oath Sworn are to blip around, to teleport around, and now you have a fight on your hands that's wildly different from just fighting a group of Mookies, right? And I don't know if Mookie is a a bad word or some kind of a Muppet slur. I don't know what that is, but Mooks, you know, is a very common term. It means low-level chumps. (laughs) Something is, you know, like a mushroom in Mario. You jump on its head and it's gone. (laughs) Okay. What are those guys called? Goombas? Yeah, I think that's also like some kind of Italian slur or something. (laughs) Wow. Okay, so moving on. The third piece in my monster set, uh, as you can see if you're looking on the thinky sheet on Patreon, is the Oath Machine. Now, this is kind of like a, 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 a dwarven tank. Now, since we're in Black Salt Spire, I imagine this thing being made out of this sort of black iron that has like a salty crust on it from being underwater for a century. And so it's got this, you know, have you ever encountered these kind of these metals that have been slightly corroded by seawater? They're very, very abrasive to the touch and and almost corrosive and kind of sting when you touch them. And that's how I imagine this thing, this huge iron machine. Now, this thing has very low hit points, but it is extremely difficult to destroy. So to build out your Oath Machine, give it a huge bonus on all of its stats. You know, something like plus 6 to plus 10, depending on how you're tuning things. Um, it gets should get big bonuses on its damage and so forth. I'm giving it three actions per turn. So this thing is formidable. Now, as for its abilities, it has a ram, right, which can push enemies. It has a barrage where it can shoot a million arrows out. It has a huge arrow like an arbalest that it shoots that'll pin someone to a wall. It has like whirling axes on it. But the real interesting thing about the Oath Machine is not its attacks. It is its ability called Solid Iron. Now, with Solid Iron, this thing ignores any damage done to it that is under 10. And when it does take damage, it only ever takes one damage. So if you do it 40 damage, that's enough to get through its 10 resistance, but it will take one click of damage. This thing doesn't even barely have moving parts. It's just a lump of iron. So all you need to do is give this thing number of attacks, or number of hit points, sorry, and that number of hit points will be the number of successful attacks that have to be made against it. So if you give it 10 hit points, that's how many 
10 plus attacks will have to be made against it to defeat it, right? So this lets you time the lifetime of this oath machine. And then finally, I gave it an ability which it can only be harmed by metal. And so this is going to have to be figured out because spells normally are far higher damage, right? Or other magical effects. But this thing just needs to be hacked into oblivion. It's immune to everything. It's immune to cold. It's immune to fire. The only thing that can hurt it is metal. And metal doing over 10 in one hit does it one hit point. So if you want it to last a really long time, you could give it 15 hit points. But 15 rounds, even that's if every single attack is successful, that's eternity at the tabletop. So you might even want to give it like four hit points or five hit points. That much even could be really difficult for a group to defeat. Now, how do you use the Oath Machine? The first time the players face one of these Oath Machines, they face it by itself. They realize how scary this thing is, how it can defeat them, how it can cause them to retreat. Maybe the Oath Machine doesn't even chase them. It's just there to stop them from going through a certain doorway, and they can trick their way around it. But to escalate, you combine the Oath Machine with both a group of Oath Sworn, so it just has these sort of disposable army guys around it. Then you combine it with the Oath Sworn and the Oath Reader. And you see how you take the very simple... Oath Sworn encounter at the beginning. You take the escalated Oath Sworn with the Oath Reader. Then you bring things backward, only the Oath Machine. Then you combine all three. Just that flow gives you the skeleton and the fundamentals of a very awesome night or even two nights of gameplay is going through that sequence. Now all you need is a few places to do the combat some rooms and some tunnels, and you're working your way through Black Salt Spire and so forth. But the experience of this monster escalation is now ready to go. Now, for me, in Black Salt Spire, this is the home of these sea giants, these undead sea giants. And, of course, that's going to be sort of some of my final encounter fuel, right? And then if uh, my players can handle the undead sea giants with this monster set, I might consider combining those. But it might be a fun... Uh, relief and form of variety to get rid of some of the oath sworn and to completely change the vibe and go just to the sea giants. You know, that, that, that's what my instincts say I should do is, uh, you know, relieve some of this combat fatigue. Because remember, one of my, uh, one of my real um, beliefs about an RPG session is that the biggest, most intense combat should not be the last one because a lot of the players have battle fatigue by then. And I don't mean the characters have battle fatigue. I mean the players are sort of tired. And so I think two-thirds of the way through a session is really where you want your biggest fight because people are ready for it. They're alert. They're ready to be in their characters. And then as your final battle, what's usually is portrayed as the boss battle, I make it simpler and faster and a little more gadgety. And it lets players be a little bit tired without having to slog their way through another 300 hit points of dragon, <laughs> right? So that's it. It's just that simple. That's a monster set. It's a simple art of thinking in the trio formula and then using them as an intercombining, escalating puzzle. You have the mooks, you have the anchor, and you have the unkillable. And these can take so many different forms, and you can introduce them in different orders. You can have, let's say you want to change your theme. Let's stick with the ocean, though. So my unkillable could be like a giant crab, and that's the first thing they fight first. But this thing is almost impossible to harm because of its tough shell. And then my mooks or my disposables are like these jellyfish men, <laughs> right? And that's my second encounter. Then my third encounter is jellyfish men with my unkillable. Then only in my third encounter do I reveal my anchor monster, which is which is some kind of giant frog. And this frog uses his tongue to move the other monsters around and he releases this huge croak, which empowers both the jellyfish men and the, cra the, the crab. Or maybe the croak is like a, a deafening sort of sonic AOE attack. And really it's almost impossible to defeat the jellyfish men until you take out that giant frog. And so just revealing my trio in a different order gives me a completely different feeling of dynamic to the night. Facing the unkillable first is, is kind of intense for the characters. 
But regardless, the theoretical construct of the of the trio is what I wanted to introduce to you guys and hopefully give you, you know, one of those little guides that help you face that blank page, right? You know you need to write down three little bullets. You need your MOOC, your anchor, and your unkillable. And this elite's guest you started. Now maybe you're gonna make a four monster set or a five monster set or a two monster set. But for me, one of the toughest creative challenges in what we do as a hobby is facing that blank page. Now, once you're in motion and you're writing and your mind is moving, things tend to create themselves and you're having fun. But the blank page, to me, is the greatest challenge that we face. And that's what I propose or hope to solve with the RPG mainframe. So this has been a little glimpse into a much larger project that I will be introducing here in time, which includes the Black Salt Spire, and the Oath Sworn. So I hope this has been helpful for you guys as you continually create monsters. I know that it's a challenge we all face week after week as Dungeon Masters. So I hope this is a useful tool for all of you guys out there fighting the good fight and making awesome adventures for players all over the world. <laughs> okay, this is Hank and Fernail signing off, and thanks everybody for tuning in. And as always, thank you for supporting Runehammer here on Patreon, and welcome to the new patrons, my shield dwarves. And, uh, well, yeah, that's it for now. You've been listening to the RPG Mainframe. This is episode 13, and I'll see you guys on the internet. Mm -hmm.